The crypto market is climbing as we have seen the details released from the White House directly about the executive order signed today, Wednesday, March the 9th. We'll take a look at the full fact sheet as well as reactions from Janet Yellen and Gary Gensler. And in a new Forbes article, they take a look at Ripple and the Swift Monopoly. But if we haven't met before, my name is Frank Cho. I'm here to help you live a richer life. On this channel, we talk about cryptocurrency, personal finance, and investing. If you haven't hit that subscribe button, do it now. That way I can keep you informed of all the latest news and updates. Let's take a quick look at the crypto market before we dive in. We're up 6% on the 24-hour, back to $1.84 trillion. Bitcoin is back over 42000 up almost 9%. On the day, Ethereum, 2750, XRP back at about 76 cents, up 5%. Look at Luna, though, up 22% on the day, about to break 100. Solana back to almost 90, up 5%. Uh, Avalanche up almost 10%, back to just about $80. And you can see positive trends basically top to bottom in the crypto market. A lot of green today on news that we are seeing here from the executive order. Let's take a quick run through of what's here. This is the White House fact sheet detailing the signed executive order on ensuring responsible innovation in digital assets. So we'll go through everything in here. There's six main points they hit on and I think they are important for us to be considering. Let's dive in. Digital assets, including crypto, have seen explosive growth in re recent years, surpassing a $3 trillion market cap last November and up from fo uh, $14 billion just five years prior. Surveys suggest that around 16% of adult Americans, approximately 40 million people, have invested in, traded, or used cryptocurrencies. Over 100 countries are exploring or piloting CBDCs, a digital form of a country's for, uh, sovereign currency. The rise in digital assets creates an opportunity to reinforce American leadership in the global financial system and at the technological frontier, but also has substantial implications for consumer protection, financial stability, national security, and climate risk. The U.S., must maintain technological leadership in this rapidly growing space, supporting innovation while mitigating the risks for consumers, businesses, the broader financial system, and the climate, and it must play a leading role in international engagement and global governance of digital assets consistent with democratic values and U.S. global competitiveness. Look at this paragraph. There are some key things in here. Supporting innovation play a leading role in international engagement. This is why this is being seen in a positive light, and this is why you're seeing the crypto markets respond very favorably, because this is taking that approach of cultivating innovation and trying to seek leadership versus seeding leadership, like we've seen from Gary Gensler in particular. That is why today President Biden will sign an executive order outlining the first ever whole of government approach to addressing the risks and harnessing the potential benefits of digital assets and their underlying technology. The order lays out a national policy for digital assets across six key priorities. So here are the six items that they're going to focus on and they'll talk about in more detail here in the latter part of this press release. Six key priorities, consumer and investor protection, financial stability, illicit finance, U.S. leadership in the global financial system and economic competitiveness, financial inclusion, and responsible innovation. Specifically, the order calls for measures to protect U.S. consumers, investors, and businesses by directing the Department of the Treasury and other agency partners to assess and develop policy recommendations to address the implications of the growing digital asset sector and changes in financial markets for consumers, investors, businesses, and equitable economic growth. The order also encourages regulators to ensure sufficient oversight and safeguard against any systemic financial risks posed by digital assets. 
to protect U.S. and global financial stability and mitigate systemic risk by encouraging the Financial Stability Oversight Council, or FSOC, to identify and mitigate economy-wide financial risks posed by digital assets and to develop appropriate policy recommendations to address any regulatory gaps. Three, mitigate the illicit finance and national security risks posed by the illicit use of digital assets. That's important. They highlight here illicit use. So not that digital assets are bad, but they can be used in a bad way, just like cash or any other asset. So uh, mi mitigate the risk by directing an unprecedented focus of coordination or coordinated action across all relevant U.S. government agencies uh, to mitigate these risks. It also directs agencies to work with our allies and partners to ensure international frameworks, capabilities, and partnerships are aligned and responsive to risks, promote U.S. leadership in technology and economic competitiveness to reinforce U.S. leadership in the global financial system by directing the Department of Commerce to work with the U.S. government in establishing a framework to drive U.S. competitiveness and leadership in and leveraging of digital asset technologies. This framework will serve as a foundation for agencies and integrate this as a priority into their policy, research and development, and operational approaches to digital assets. This is one of the first times we've seen the Department of Commerce mentioned versus typically when we're looking at a U.S. department, it's the Department of the Treasury that they refer to. These government agencies usually have some sort of regu regulatory responsibility to a department and certainly to the Senate, but the Department of Commerce now being called out specifically. Promote equitable access to safe and affordable financial services by affirming the critical need for safe, affordable, and accessible financial services as a U.S. national interest that must inform our approach to digital asset innovation, including disparate impact risk. Such safe access is especially important for communities that have long had insufficient access to financial services. The Secretary of the Treasury, working with all relevant agencies, will produce a report on the future of money and payment systems to include implications for economic growth, financial growth, and inclusion, national security, and the extent to which technological innovation may influence that future, support technological advances, and ensure rapid development and use of digital assets by directing the U.S. government to take concrete steps to study and support technological advances in the responsible development, design, and implementation of digital asset systems while prioritizing privacy, security, combating illicit exploitation, and reducing negative climate impacts. And finally, explore a U.S. central bank digital currency by placing urgency on research and development of a potential U.S. CBDC should issuance be deemed in the, in the national interest. The order directs the U.S. government to assess the technological infrastructure and capacity needs for a potential U.S. CBDC in a manner that protects Americans' interests. The order also encourages the Fed to continue its research, development, and assessment efforts for a CBDC, including development of a plan for broader U.S. government action in support of their work. This effort prioritizes U.S. participation in multi-country experimentation and ensures U.S. leadership internationally to promote CBDC development that is consistent with U.S. priorities and democratic values. Now, we know there's a Digital Euro Foundation, a Digital Pound Foundation. Ripple is a part of both. Will we see a Digital Dollar Foundation emerge with Ripple also as a partner? Very interesting to think about. Comment below if you think that's a possibility. And finally, the administration will continue work across agencies and with Congress to establish policies that guard against risks and guide responsible innovation with our allies and partners to develop aligned international capabilities that respond to national security risks and with the private sector to study and support technological advances in digital assets. So again, you're understanding now after seeing this, some of the more favorable takeaways, you know, right here at the very end, they say working with the private sector to identify and support technological advances, 
more research on CBDCs, more partnerships, more agencies involved, more conversation. The uh, overall response I've seen, you know, just on my Twitter feed uh, has been very positive as this seeks to be that watershed moment for digital assets, uh, looking more like when the Internet was first becoming uh, part of the mainstream discourse and conversation. So let me know what you think about this, but we'll take a look at some of the statements by regulators here. So Janet Yellen has issued a statement on the executive order here. We won't look at the whole thing here, but we'll just take a quick snippet. This says, uh, President Biden's historic executive order calls for a coordinated and comprehensive approach to digital asset policy. This approach will support responsible innovation that could result in substantial benefits for the nation, consumers, and businesses. This work will complement ongoing efforts by Treasury, Already, the department has worked with the President's Working Group on Financial Markets, FDIC, and OCC to study one particular kind of digital asset, stable coins, and to make recommendations. So if you remember, the President's Working Group issued that report, and they had multiple hearings on it in the House and in the Senate. And Treasury will work to promote a fairer, more inclusive, and more efficient financial system while building on our ongoing work to counter illicit finance and prevent risk to financial stability and national security. So I'll link this down below if you want to see her full statement. This was leaked yesterday, posted prematurely, and this sort of sparked that overnight pump in the crypto markets. Uh, this was captured and shared and was seen very favorably. And then we get the fact sheet just this morning, and that further bolstered that uh, favorable take on what's happening here. Now, Gary Gensler has responded and said, Today, the president signed an executive order on crypto assets. I look forward to collaborating with colleagues across the government to achieve important public policy goals, protecting investors and consumers, guarding against illicit activity, and helping ensure financial stability. So if you look at those uh, phrases there, it mirrors exactly what Janet Yellen said here in her final words. The one thing you don't see Gary Gensler talk about is capital formation, which you would think is head of the SEC. That's part of their mission, but not mentioned anywhere there. A heavier focus on investor protection, which we know is his uh, key phrase for being able to um, solicit more power from the government. And of course, uh, illicit activity here, his mention, but nothing from Gensler on the positive side. Really a disappointment from him all around. And now finally, let's wrap up with the Forbes article just published last night on Ripple and Swift. So this is called, Why No One From Ripple To Russia Has Been Able To Topple The Swift Monopoly In An Effort To Sanction Russian President Vladimir Putin For Invading Ukraine, A Little Known But Incredibly Powerful Organization Known as SWIFT has entered the zeitgeist. Without it, banks around the world wouldn't be able to do business with each other. But even before the acronym, short for the Society for uh, Worldwide Interbank Financial Telecommunications, became broad, uh, widely known, competitors had emerged to try to break its monopoly on cross-border transactions between banks. Founded in 1973 and connecting more than 11,000 financial institutions around the world, the Belgian messaging service that lets banks securely arrange financial transactions is co-owned by some 3,500 financial firms globally. Last year, SWIFT hosted 42 million financial messages a day. SWIFT also partners with central banks, including the Bank of England, the European Central Bank, and the Federal Reserve. Efforts to replace the interbank messaging system have been mounted by crypto nerds and rogue nations alike. Among the earliest attempts, this is important, so this is talking about Ripple here directly. So among the earliest attempts was by San Francisco-based Ripple, founded in 2012 as a digital assets company, commonly associated with the XRP cryptocurrency and valued at $15 billion dollars. In 2016, the firm hired SWIFT board member Marcus uh, Treacher as its global head of strategic accounts, and the following year, 2017, it launched RippleNet as a messaging platform similar to SWIFT before layering, layering on transaction settlement using digital assets in 2018. 
Since its inception, RippleNet has openly billed itself as a competitor to Swift. While RippleNet has had difficulty holding on to its high-profile early users, RippleNet manager Ashish Birla says that the network has seen a record year with a run rate over $10 billion, about half of which is moving crypto products known as on-demand liquidity. While numbers vary widely, Swift conducts about $1.7 trillion worth of volume a day. So put that in perspective. As of this morning, about $1.84 trillion is what the crypto market is. So Swift conducts $1.7 trillion in volume daily, the equivalent roughly to the entirety of the crypto market every single day. So from a matter of scale, it's just massively larger. Ashish Birla comes from a Silicon Valley background and views his company's ledger offering for cross-border transactions similar to a blockchain as less of a decentralization play and more as a market improvement. It took banks 20 plus years since the internet to start waking up, but they need to also modernize their technology stack to compete, he says. Taking down a global financial ju uh, juggernaut has not proved easy. Ripple is currently being sued by the SEC over whether XRP is a security. While that case remains outstanding, Burla sees its resolution as a potential boon for RippleNet, which does not share the same renegade ethos associated with crypto startups and actually sees its potential product as even more suited for centralized actions like sanctions. In the case of SWIFT, a lot of countries had to bind together to freeze assets, he says. If money moves in real time like it does with these more modern payment solutions built on crypto, you can cut them off right away. Despite prognostications that crypto would explode in use from Russians trying to evade sanctions, Burla is skeptical that the volume of trading available could begin to reach the $50 billion in FX trading that Russia engaged in daily before the sanctions. He also points to the fact that exchanges are mostly regulated, unlike the perception of some pirate system. Uh, P I'm going to butcher this name, apologies. Peely uh, Braingard, CEO of crypto compliance app Notabane, pointed out that even within the limits on scope, crypto can and has been used by rogue nations as a vehicle for evading sanctions and engaging in illicit finance and money laundering activities, but it is not easy to do at scale. That's the key thing. At a large scale, from a na uh, national perspective, it's just not easy. Individuals perhaps can do it, but not from the larger country standpoint. Make no mistake, with Russia cut off from SWIFT, worker, workarounds won't be simple. In order to use another form of financial intermediary, both parties would have to agree to that avenue. While it may be easy for, easy for Russia to move its business with allies onto another set of rails, that list of sympathetic counterparts is not long. While RippleNet wouldn't help Russia circumvent sanctions, the country itself, as well as some neighbors, are working on potential workarounds. Just days after several Russian banks got the boot from SWIFT, the head of the Central Bank of Russia pitched the financial message transfer system of the Bank of Russia, which was specifically billed as a replacement for SWIFT. The Bank of Russia first launched this SWIFT alternative back in 2014, the same year Russia invaded Crimea and restrictions on Russia were first debated. Originally intended for domestic use, by April of 21, it had partners in countries sympathetic to Russia, including Belarusian banks, Armenia-based uh, Arshid Bank, and Kirksk uh, Bank of Asia and Kyrgyzstan. According to reports from Russian news agency TASS, which is state-owned, there are also negotiations underway with Chinese banks, Putin and President, uh, Chinese President Xi Jinping were r rumored to have been in touch with uh, prior to Russia's invasion and have both looked for avenues to avoid the dominance of Western democracies on the global stage. The Chinese have hinted at their own efforts to circumvent SWIFT with China Construction Bank having built BC Trade 2.0, which allows 75 financial institutions to identify risky borrowers and offer lower rates to better candidates. As of February of 21, the platform had facilitated 
over $100 billion of loans to thousands of users and notably cuts out SWIFT, as reported by Forbes. Uh, similarly, in 2019, Venezuela launched the Petro, a digital currency purportedly backed by the nation's vast oil supply and built to circumvent sanctions. As a result, it was promptly banned by former President Trump. Weaponizing SWIFT has been bandied about in the past before it was used in sanctions last week. In 2018, President Trump wanted to cut off Iran uh, despite disagreement from European allies. Ultimately, SWIFT cut ties with Iranians in order to avoid violating sanctions. So some really interesting takes in this article in Forbes about SWIFT. We know that they are the dominant player here. As we look at cross-border payments, Ripple has sought to supplant them and provide a better, faster, uh, cheaper solution. But we still have yet to see that massive scale. SWIFT operates, again, at a scale that is pretty incomprehensible. When you think $1.7 trillion a day, again, moving money, the volume of which is equal to the entire crypto market every single day is massive. And so in order to supplant that, it will take, you know, a long period of time, increased partnerships, a better solution uh, that will meet the needs of customers more than the existing existing system. And then, of course, it's just going to take a massive scaling effort. And it might not be a single system that ends up replacing it. Maybe it's multiple. And that could be one reason why Ripple preaches interoperability so much because in order to facilitate global transaction of funds, it needs a highly interoperable nature to move between blockchains as they grow and develop across the world. We'll probably see maybe a more fractionalized system, but one that's more efficient and more rapid. But let me know in the comments what you think. What will that future of the movement of money look like? Will it be dominated by one player as it has been by Swift, or will there be multiple entities operating with one another in partnership to move money and to get value across the globe. Thank you for spending some time with me. If you found any value here, hit that like button. It helps the channel a ton and make sure you get the information most important to you. Hit that subscribe button if you haven't already. That way I can keep you informed on future news and updates. And don't forget to stay tuned every Sunday for the Frank Cho Crypto Show where we'll be taking a look at XRPL projects as well as other broader crypto topics. Thank you so much for spending some of your time here with me. I do truly appreciate it. Have a fantastic rest of your day, and I will see you in the next one.